الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين محمد رسول الله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا ومن بعده we uh, looked at the first of the elements of change that Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam implemented in order to transform his community from being the most oppressed the weakest uh, to becoming the strongest and the rulers of their world of the time and that first element was to change how we view ourselves the reason for that obviously is that everything comes from the individual all change has to begin with me anyone who thinks that the way to change the world is to change somebody else and i remain the same way no doesn't work doesn't work in any field if i want change to happen in my environment that change has to begin from me and therefore my identity do i see myself as within quotes a ruler or a king and i don't mean that literally i mean in the terms of an attitude of like a king meaning that i don't obey anyone but everyone else must obey me that this doesn't work because this is not who we are allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent us as his ibad as his slaves we are here in this world to obey allah in the way of the rasul alayhi salatu was salam who showed us how to obey allah Just think about that. Think about this. We just prayed Salatul Maghrib. We prayed three rakat. If I ask you, why did you pray three rakat? Why not four? Why not two? Why not one? What is the answer? If I ask you, why did you pray in this way? Why do you start the Salah with Takbir the Harima? Why do you recite Surah Al-Fatiha first? Why do you recite Surah Al-Fatiha in every rakat? Isn't it enough to say it once? The answer to all of these questions is only one. because this is the way rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam prayed period why 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 because this is how rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam did that action i'm reminded to myself is the same principle applies for everything in life it is not restricted to salah salah is the example which shows me how i should do business salah shows me how i must handle my family shall salah shows me if i am a ruler of a country how i must rule my country if i am a judge in a court shall salah shows me how i must give my rulings and my judgments in the court and so on and so on if i am a business person business man or woman salah shows me how to do business and that's the reason for studying the sirah the salah is the example we do it the way of muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam then it becomes accepted by allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then it becomes full of khair and barakah for all concerned including myself we go to the second part of the transformation that rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam brought about and that is a transformation in culture we start with the individual then we go into the surrounding of the uh, the, the surroundings in which the individual lives and works and functions and that surrounding is called the culture the culture was to move from discrimination from high and low to equality genuine equality everyone equal before allah this is what islam brought in islam there is no superior or inferior to the extent the sahaba came to us sallam some of them were people in their travels they had gone to the courts of different kings and so on and they said ya rasulullah if you permit us we would like to make sajda to you as the way of greeting you because this is how the kings of rome and persia and other places this is their way that when people come into the court they are there is a demand they are, they are commanded to make sajda to put their hand on the ground in front of the king so some, some of them they just lie down flat on their face and you deserve it more than any of them because you are not only our ruler but you are the rasul of allah so therefore we if you permit us this is how we would like to greet you by making sujood to you 
Rasul said, no, sajda is only to Allah and we are all equal before Allah and I am his abd and his Rasul. Right? In Islam, there is complete equality between all people in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in this beautiful ayat al karima of Surah al hujurat Allah said, Ya ayyuhal nas, inna khalaqnakum min dhakari wa untha wa ja'alnakum shu'uban wa kaba'ila lita'arafu. Inna akramakum inda Allahi atqaakum inna allaha alimun khabir. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, O oh, oh mankind, O oh human beings, we have created you from a male and a female and made you into nations and tribes so that you may know, you may recognize, you may honor one another, not for you to discriminate and say the black man is, 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 is inferior to the white man and vice versa and so on and the Arab and the Adam, no. And Allah said, verily the most honorable of you is the one who has the most taqwa. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all-knowing and all-aware. So Islam changed the criterion of superiority from wealth and power and authority and skin color or concepts of beauty or whatever or lineage to taqwa. This is the sense of equality that Islam brought, which did not exist before Islam, and may Allah have mercy on us, it does not exist today. We have gone back full circle. Now, one way to look at that is to feel sad about it, but the other way to look at it is that if you have gone back full circle, then we can go back full circle. We can go back to the stage where Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi had brought this law and people lived by that law and therefore they benefited. Now, <clears throat> like everything else, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam demonstrated in his own life the things that he preached. Right? He demonstrated them in his own life. So when he preached equality, he treated everyone as equal. He had a slave, Zaid bin Haritha, and he freed him. And in that case, it's a beautiful long story. I won't go into that here because we are short of time. But he gave him the name Zaid bin Muhammad. And the name went back to Zaid bin Haritha only after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the ayat in Surah Al-Ahzab, where Allah prohibited the adoption of uh, a child, man or woman, and adoption meaning giving the, that child your own name. There is no prohibition to look after children. There is no prohibition to look after orphans. You can look after them, you can keep them in your home. That is the preferred way, not put them into an orphanage. The preferred way is to take them into your family. So then they have a sense of family with them. But you cannot give them your name. The lineage comes from the, from the father, and biologically, that father remains the father. Rasulullah also, when he formed the Ummah in, uh, in Medina, Rasulullah made paired one Muhajir Sahabi with one Ansari Sahabi. And if you look at the pairs that he made, there are some of them which were, who were very, very dissimilar. Very different. For example, he paired Salman al-Farsi, who was a Persian slave, with Abu Darda al-Ansari, who was among the leaders of the Khazraj. He was a chieftain uh, in Medina. So here was an Arab, a noble Arab. He is being paired with a man who came from Persia, and he was a slave. Now, see, the how, see how the Sahaba did this. Now, Salman Farsi Radilano was, uh, he was a slave later on. Rasulullah uh, helped him to buy his freedom. He used to work for this man and uh, he asked him, you know, set a price. What do I need to pay you to become free? The man said, your price is 300 
fully mature bearing date palm trees. So how is he going to find that? First of all, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's an enormous fortune. And secondly, bearing, growing date palm means what? Means he has to, I mean, you can't just pick it up from somewhere. So he has to grow it. So he came to his son and he said, Rasulullah, this is what he's saying. Rasulullah said to him, first one, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam announced to the people, he said, who is willing to help Salman Farsi Radalano to become free? Donate a date palm sapling, a small tree. So the Sahaba, they brought the trees. So they had these 300 trees, they were stacked in one place, like a nursery. Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said to Salman Farsi, go and dig the holes, dig the pits. And don't plant anything. Complete all the pits. Do whatever you need to do. And then come and tell me. Salman Farsi Radhelano, he went and he dug all the pits, 300 pits. You have to dig a big pit, huh? It's three, three feet by three feet by three feet. So big pits. Uh, you know, our planters, we know this stuff. It's not easy. Very difficult. And then you put manure and organic matter and God knows what in the, in the thing. Get it ready. And then he came and said to Mr. Sahih, Ya Rasulullah, the pits are ready. Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam went and he planted those trees with his own hand, all 300 of them, by himself. <laughs> uh, what an amazing lesson in leadership. That's the meaning of leadership. Leadership is not to simply sit around and order, oh, move this, move that. No, 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 no. He takes an interest in this man who's a stranger from nowhere. He comes from Persia. He's a slave. Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam takes interest in him to the extent that he plants those trees himself. With his own blessed hands. And Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, the tree that the Nabi plants. Allah caused them to grow. Allah caused them to become bearing trees and then the Salman al-Farsi who was freed. So when he becomes the, the brother of Abu Darda al-Ansari, Abu Darda al-Ansari was a beautiful Sahabi. He was among, apart from being uh, a chieftain of the Khadrad, he was a very pious man. He was known for his Zod. He was known for the amount of Salah and the Zikr and his fasting and so on. He was a very pious man. He was very, very, uh, you know, strict with himself. So Salman Farsi Radhalano one day, now he's staying with him in his house. Did everything. So he comes home one day. Abu Darda is not there. Umbu Darda is there. Radhalana. Later on, she became a great muhaddisa. And she used to give dars of Quran in Masjid Nabi, dars of Hadith in Masjid Nabi Sharif. She's one of the one of the one of the, one of the first classical muhaddisat, classical women scholars of hadith. So she was in the house and she was, you know, her appearance was like disabled and looked like she wasn't taking care of herself. So Salman Farsi said to her, "My sister, why are you like this? What happened to you? You're not well or something?" He said, "No, I'm well." But what is the point in me adorning myself? What is the point in me? doing anything because my husband is not interested in me. So Salman Farsi said, why do you say that? He said, because he prays all night and he fasts all day and he has no time for me. So Salman Farsi said, okay, I will take care of this. That day, when in the afternoon, Abu Darda Radhelanu came home, and he brought food for Salman al-Farsi. He put it down. He said, my brother, please sit and eat. He said, no, you have to sit and eat with me. He said, no, I'm fasting. He said, break your fast. It's a dafil fast. It's not Ramadan or something. Break your fast. He said, yes, I'm fasting. He said, no, break your fast. Otherwise, I won't eat. So Abu Dada said, okay. So he broke his fast. He sat with him. He ate food. Then in the night... They lay down to sleep and Abu Darda made sure, made sure Salman al-Farsi is comfortable and so on and then he was, he said, where are you going? He said, I'm going to pray. He said, no, which prayer? We finished, we finished Isha, Isha Salah. 
Now is the time to sleep. To sleep. He said, I want to stand in, in Qiyam. He said, well, no, no Qiyam, you stay asleep. So Abu Darda Radhilanu lay down. After a little while, Abu Darda Radhilanu tried to get up. Salman Farsi said, where are you going? He said, Wallah, you don't even sleep, I mean. He said, I'm going to, for Tajud, he said, no Tajud, you sleep. Now this happened two or three times. By now, Abu Dhabdha Radhella, you can imagine, he is so irritated. This man, he is my brother, Allah, but I mean, this is like oppression. This is wrong on me. I want to pray, the man is stopping me from praying. I was fasting, he made me break my fast. What is this? Finally, last third of the night, Salman Farsi Radhella, who also woke up, he also made wudu, Abu Dhabdha also made wudu Radhella, and they both prayed Tahajjud, and then they went to the masjid for Salatul Fajr. After Salatul Fajr, Rasulullah used to turn around and sit down and he would say, has anyone seen any dream? If they had a dream, he would interpret, he would say, has anyone has a question? He would answer a question, he would do a khatira. So he turned around and Abu Darda said, Ya Rasulullah, I have a complaint against my brother. Tabi Salaam said, what is the complaint? He said, my brother is oppressing me. <laughs> Oppressing me, I I want to fast. He does not make me does not let me fast. He makes me forces me to break my fast. I want to pray tajud. He stops me. So now see the see the hikmat of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam says Salman Farsi is sitting there. He didn't ask him directly. He says, so what did your brother tell you? Why did he do this? He says my brother tells me that Allah has a right on you. Your body has a right on you. And your family, your wife has a right on you. Give to each one their right. Rasulullah said, your brother has spoken the truth. Give to each one their right. Now think about this. What level of brotherhood is it that you can force your brother to do these things? Huh? Can we do that to our own blood brothers today? <laughs> That was the level of love and affection. Bilal bin Rabah He was made the brother of Abu Nuwain al Khatami. Again, one of, one of the big shots in Madira. Who is his brother? He's an African Abyssinian slave. Radhelanu. So now, Abu Nuwain al Khatami wants to get married. Now, Abu, the Bilal bin Ramah is, you know, ex-slave, but in the, in, the, in the Muslim community, he was a big man. I mean, he was the confidant of Rasulullah Sallallahu He was the, uh, he used to keep his finances and so on. So, he, he, was, he had big Aizah, Alhamdulillah. So, Abu Ruhayim says to him, uh, I want to marry this woman uh, in Madina, and uh, I, I request you, can you come with me and... Uh, you know, recommend to her father. I want to make, give a proposal. So, can you recommend me to her father so that maybe she will, he will accept? So, Bilal Radhilan says, Yes, I'll come with you. And they go there. So, Bilal Radhilan says, This is my brother uh, Abu Ruwaim, and uh, he's a very good man, and mashallah, he is good in his deen, he is practicing and everything else, but he has a short temper. So, he gets angry very fast. So Abu Ruwaim said, you came to, you are not supposed to recommend me, what kind of recommendation? You are telling the father I was short temper, he won't, he won't give us what? <laughs> uh, he said, no, I have, to, I have to speak the truth, I mean, you have a short temper, you get angry very fast. Imagine the kind of brotherhood, brotherhood there was, you know, they, was, they, they loved each other more than, may Allah forgive us, we love our, our own brothers, our blood brothers and sisters. This is what Rasulullah created. To establish one of the reasons that Allah knows the reason, one of the reasons for establishing or, or the ways of establishing uh, the principle of equality, Rasulullah chooses Bilal bin Rabah Radhelanu to call the Adhan after Fatah Makkah. Every one of the Sahaba there, they would have given 10 years of their lives to do that. Right? First time Adhan is being called, it means the history, imagine the history. First time Adhan is being called in the Kaaba after cleaning the Kaaba off all the idols. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who was the most 
truly, if you look at it, who was the most suitable person to do that? Was the Prophet ﷺ himself? He is the Nabi, it is his job to call the people to Allah. He should have called Allah himself. He didn't do that. He gives that job to Bilal bin Rabah. People, some of the, some of the Quraysh uh, yeah, youth, youth they, they laughed, oh, who is this black man? One man said, oh, you know, I'm, I'm happy my father died, otherwise he would have seen this black man calling the other. That black man, the Kaaba was under his feet. He was standing on top of the Kaaba. Hey? Rasulullah wanted to establish no black, no white, no nothing, no Arab, no Ajam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, here is a man, Al Bilal bin Rabah radiallahu in whose heart Allah's love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala permeates his heart. This is the man of taqwa. With Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the position of Bilal is such radiallahu anhu. Rasulullah said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when I went in Miraj and Islam al Miraj, I, and they showed me Jannah, and I heard your footsteps, Ya Bilal, in Jannah. Uh, he recognized the footsteps of Bilal. He said, this is Bilal walking in Jannah. In which Jannah? Jannah to Firdaus of Rasulullah sallallahu That is Bilal. One day Abu Dhabi Rifari radiallahu anhu, again he was very short tempered. So, no, he was, he, his temper was such that Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa he asked him, Ya Rasulullah give me advice. He said, do not accept authority even over one man. That's my advice to you. He said, don't. Because he had a short temper. He said, if you, if, you, if you have authority over somebody, maybe you will beat him or something and Allah SWT will punish you. No. Don't accept authority. He told him, if you get angry, if you are standing, sit down. If you are, if you are sitting down, lie down. Physically. These are all anger, anger management uh, techniques uh, that Nabi SAW is teaching him. He said, if you get angry, if somebody, if there is a fight happening, people are cursing, he said, call the other Call Azhar, because shaitan runs away. He said, if you get angry, if you are feeling angry, go back Udo. Final point of culture is responsibility for the entire community. Starting in concentric circles. Starting with myself and my immediate family. Then going to my neighborhood. Then go, meaning Muslims. And then going further, meaning non-Muslims, country, world. An individual Muslim is responsible for everyone who comes into contact with him in one way or the other. And we know the uh, many hadiths concerning the rights of the neighbors and so on and so on, so I won't take your time here to narrate them, but do, do study them. It was to the point where Rasulullah said that the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala emphasized the rights of the neighbors to such an extent that I thought Jibreel is going to come with the hukum to say the neighbor will, is your inheritor. He will, part of your tarka, part of your inheritance has to go to the neighbor. So my question to myself and you is, how do we behave? And that's where we come, come here now, is, do we discriminate against people? Do we have, do we feel within ourselves this superiority, inferiority thing? Right? I am Hyderabadi, nobody can make biryani like me, therefore I am the most superior person in the whole world. You agree or you don't agree? <laughs> really, I mean, jokes apart, seriously, do we have this kind of superiority, inferiority stuff or not? Is it happening in our communities? If it is happening, it must be stopped. This is not from Islam. This is not from Islam. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent us as a blessing for the whole world. And that's why the metrics of this again, what will we, like the one we did with the first one, which is what will we start doing, what will we stop doing, what will we, conti what will we continue to do. So two things we have done, one in terms of my identity, what is it that I will start doing, I will start obeying Allah. What will I stop doing, I will stop disobeying Allah. What will I continue to do? I will continue to obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wherever and whichever way I was doing it. Alhamdulillah. As far as the culture is concerned, culture of Islam, what will I start doing? I will start treating everyone as equal. 
Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, the one who does not treat, does not respect our elders and who does not have uh, shafqat and uh, tenderness and gentleness with the youngsters is not from us. So rights of people, rights of parents, rights of children, rights of brothers, sisters, rights of co-workers and so on, all of this must be done. So if I'm not doing it, I must start doing it. If I am guilty of any of the infarction of these rights, if I've done anything wrong with somebody, immediately go apologize to them, make comments with them. Believe me, we don't want to carry this with us when we meet Allah. And continuing, Alhamdulillah, whatever you're doing, which is good, please continue. Do it, inshallah. Jazakumullah khair. Wassalamu alaikum.